this is my main focus. However, I've been studying for a long time uh, two additional topics uh, related to this PPAR. Uh, one is mastitis, uh, because if PPAR regulate immune system uh, by reducing inflammation, but also make the, should be make the, the immune cell better equipped to face uh, uh, any, any challenge, uh, this is a target. If you can actually use, uh, activate PPAR in order to achieve a better response to uh, mastitis, for instance. And another um, uh, topic is also improve um, milk quality, especially milk fat synthesis. So hello everyone, this is Luis Ferrero with the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. And today we'll be interviewing Dr. Massimo uh, Biona, which is an associate professor at Oregon State. And our goal is to discuss two very intriguing topics. Uh, first, nutrigenomics, what that is, why is that important, and how can you better use that uh, in the field and hopefully make some good decisions associated with that. And then we will follow up with some discussions about byproducts, but more specifically about uh, what do we know about the spent hemp byproducts and how this could be an interesting feed uh, for dairy cattle. But before we get into that discussion, uh, first Massimo, thank you so much for joining us today. Could you please give us a brief background about yourself? Yes, uh, so I am Italian originally. I grew up in a dairy up north in the Alps, in a high mountains. I actually, I, since I was five years old until I started university, 19 years old, I uh, spent my summer in the mountains grazing cows, milking them by hand, and later on making fontina cheese. So I did that until I was 19, and then I started at the university, and I couldn't go anymore on the on the dairy, but my uh, my uh, passion for dairy start growing up in a dairy. And then after that, I did uh, my university down in Italy at the Piacenza, is the Catholic University in Piacenza. I graduated there both as an undergrad with a thesis uh, in uh, um, was was ruminant nutrition uh, in my region uh, with Professor uh, Giuseppe Bertoni, and then I continued with him my PhD. Uh, where I, I work on nutrifysiogenomics uh, around the peripartum period, where we start actually to work on uh, the problem of inflammation in peripartum period. Um, after that, I, uh, I did my first postdoc at Penn State with Gabriela Varga when I started to do some my nutrigenomic work. And then um, I moved to Illinois, uh, where I spent three years with Dr. Juan Law, uh, working on the nutrifysiogenomics in uh, mostly on cattle, but we did all sorts of species. And after that, I, I did also three additional years of postdoc with Professor Matthew Wheeler at the University of Illinois again there, uh, working with uh, use of mesenchyma stem cell for bone regeneration, especially maxillofacial bone regeneration. And then since 2000, at the end of 2012, I joined uh, the Oregon State University where I'm residing now. And uh, my main field of research on genomics, in dairy management and welfare. I work a bit on, on uh, milk and human health. And then I also uh, work now a lot on hemp uh, as a my feed for dairy cows or actually all species, not just cow. Adiseo, a global leader in nutritional solutions and the provider of Smart Amine M, the best in-class rumen protected methionine product for dairy producers who want to optimize milk production capture more value from their components, and maintain the lifetime performance of their herds. For more product information and to calculate your return on investment when you balance your feed with amino acids, go to milkpay.com. Now, thanks for, uh, for this introduction. And starting, you know, with nutrigenomics. So tell us, what exactly is nutrigenomics? Yeah, genomics is a very interesting uh, field of research, uh, uh, starting humans uh, or monogastric before uh, dairy cows, but uh, practically in a, in a very sim simple way is try to exploit the bioactive compound in the feed uh, and especially with those bioactive compounds, they affect the cell biology by interacting with the genome. So they... Uh, change the, the expression of genes, uh, either increasing expression of several genes or decreasing some. And this way, change the biology of the cell because the gene, of course, they code for 
uh, protein, which are the working horse inside the cell. And so if you affect this, then you affect the cell, which affect the tissue, which affect organs, and then the whole physiology of the animal. And the ultimate purpose in autogenomics work I, I try to pursue is to try to improve the performance of health of the animal. Uh, just to give you a quick example, um, if you want, as a human, if you want to become stronger, we exercise, right? We, we do this. And what happened during exercise, we turn on genes and we change the physiology of, and, and actually structure certain tissues. And it's all driven by genes changing, uh, increasing the expression, decreasing the expression. So through training, we kind of use non nutrigenomics so we do the same thing. Do, through nutrigenomics, try to use the biotic compound to achieve some of those results. I don't know if that helps explain in a nutshell what nutrigenomics is. No, I think that's a great explanation. And, 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 and tell us a little bit more about uh, the specifics uh, related to nutrigenomics that you are working on and how does that change the cow? Sure, it's a, a great question. So uh, one way how those body compounds affect the genome is through what's called transcriptional factors. Uh, those are proteins, specialized protein in, a, in the cell, which they sense and bind uh, those biotic compound, and after that happen, uh, those transcription factors move into the nuclei if, uh, if uh, they are already not there, and they interact with DNA and then, you know, determine the expression of genes. So it's very interesting to study those transcription factors. There are two which I'm especially interested on for the, the improving the, the, the production and the performance and health of the, of the dairy cows. One is called the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor, uh, which the, uh, is in simple way we call it PPAR. And it is a very interesting, uh, it's called a nuclear receptor because it is already in some way in the nuclei and uh, is work somewhat similar to the estrogen receptor in the sense that uh, uh, when bind uh, the, the body compound need to interact with another protein and with those protein, they, they, they form this heterodimer, they move into the, the DNA and then they... Uh, control the expression of many genes. And why the PPAR are interesting? Um, a lot of work done, especially in monogastric and in human, um, the PPAR are one that respond to starvation. Uh, uh, they have a tremendous control of the metabolic stat status of the, the animal. They also uh, control immune system. Um, they are interacting, they have also some function uh, as antioxidant. And then also they are master regulator of tissue repair and regeneration. So they have so many functions. And uh, um, one thing particular about those uh, PIPA is that they bind fatty acid uh, with the different characteristics and stuff like this. And we know that even though we we don't feed a lot of fatty acid compared to monogastric, which can, they can have up to 30% fatty acid diet, uh, in cow we feed less. But my purpose is to try to use the fatty acid to, to interact with those PIPA and then uh, change or affect the performance of the animal. Now, uh, the PIPA, the story, like all the, the story in science, they are more complex than this very simplistic explanation because there are three different types of PIPA. They're called alpha, gamma, and delta. Um, they have different functions. So when they interact, with fatty acid, also the interaction of fatty acid is different between the three. They are, the expression is different between tissues, and then they have ultimately a different function. For instance, the people alpha is more involved in the metabolism, catabolism, like uh, use of fatty acid uh, when they, the liver burn fatty acid into um, uh, these people that control a lot of that, is the, the typical uh, transcription factor which is activated during starvation because respond to non esterified fatty acid. Then there's the PIPAR delta, which is pretty much expressed everywhere in the, to the body, has many functions, and one function seems to, to, to be prevalent is tissue repair. And then it has PIPAR gamma, which we don't know yet, even though some of the data produced in my lab seem to suggest that they respond to fatty acid. They might not respond to fatty acid in human, is not so evident. But once activated, seem to have a, a prevalent role in controlling the adipose tissue and the immune system. So, why this PIPAR would be interesting for cows, especially cow around transition, uh, as pe people working in the, in the dairy industry knows that the transition cow are the key 
uh, factor because if a cow have a bad transition, uh, will be a, a costly cow, will be very poor performing cow. But if the cow goes through a smooth transition or this peripartum period from uh, dry to lactation, without any issue, the cow will be a performing cow, no problem. And so the the idea is that, and we know that a lot of these problems associated with the transition cow are led to a metabolic adaptation or maladaptations, but also now very hot as a topic is the, the topic of inflammation, which is actually the one that I originally started to study when I was a PhD, now I have again an interest to going back to it. And so if uh, inflammation and that's associated with this increase in uh, in this catabolism happening, this, in the, this kind of... Uh, this infla uh, inflammation happening, there's also oxidative stress, which is a major issue around uh, peripartum period. And so PPAR, activation of PPAR might be able to regulate all this and to make the transition again of the cow better. So in some way, diminish the, the, the negative effect of a heightened inflammation, uh, reduce or help the cow to face this high catabolic state that is just after parturition, especially high non fatty acid, make the liver more able to use them in a more efficient way, uh, and then also help in a way to direct the production of, uh, of glucose toward the mammary gland for the milk production. Again, all this with the purpose of improving the health and the performance of the animal. Unlock whole herd performance with Zimpro Isofra. This one-of-a-kind technology enhances rumen performance and advances efficiency by directly feeding the rumen microbes. What's the result? Decreased dry matter intake, increased energy corrected milk, better feed efficiency, and a herd that is better equipped to navigate the stress of lactation phases and seasonal change. Learn more at zimpro.com forward slash isofirm. So if we could summarize the nutrigenomics benefits for producers, would this area that you just described associated with minimizing inflammation or helping cows to go through a healthier transition period, would those be the main benefits or are there other things that you see that would be key for the dairy farmer? This is my main focus. However, I have been studying for a long time uh, two additional topics uh, related to this PPAR. Uh, one is mastitis, uh, because if PPAR regulate the immune system, uh, by reducing inflammation, but also make the should be make the, the immune cell better equipped to face uh, uh, any any challenge. Uh, this is a target. If you can actually use uh, activate PPAR in order to achieve a better response to uh, mastitis, for instance. Another, another um, uh, topic is also improve uh, milk quality, especially milk fat synthesis. It was a topic that I been working a lot. Uh, uh, in order to again achieve the goal of activating PPAR uh, to uh, improve milk fat synthesis. Now, something that I have to immediately disclose is that uh, we are still doing a lot of basic work and there's not yet an, uh, a nutrigenomic application. Um, and uh, the major reason for this is that every we, we do stuff in vitro. In general, they work well, we get good results. But in vitro, we sell is completely different than an in vivo system where the complexity is very large. And there's also this, this regulation, this network, this feedback, uh, where it's very difficult to change the system uh, immediately. So uh, stuff that works very well in vitro, then you go in vivo, and the results are very, very tiny. And so uh, the, the, there's way more work to be done in order to achieve the goal of really use nutrigenomics as a tool at the farm level. Um, and major challenge for this is that um, it's very difficult to come by funding for that because it's too basic of research, there has not much application. And uh, the, of course, the, the, the for instance, USDA has no too much interest if there's no immediate application. And so it became a little bit challenge to get funding, but it's definitely the direction is to do way more uh, basic work before to move into um, the in vivo and achieve some goal. Uh, right now, for instance, we fatty acid, have, they are very bioactive, not just through the PPAR, they, they can do many, many other things. We have worked with the fatty acid for many, many years. Uh, we know that there is some benefit to use fatty acids, certain fatty acids that are more beneficial, 
but often we don't know why they're happening. Uh, we know they produce more energy, but being bioactive, we don't know exactly what's going on. It's kind of a little bit of black box. And in order to achieve what is called the precision feeding, we have to account for this bioactivity. And so that's kind of the reason why more basic study try to understand what exactly happened is somewhat necessary. Now, thanks for, for all this explanation. Now, certainly is an area that uh, there is a lot to learn and a lot that the producers can uh, benefit from. Masmo, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, for you at home, this is the first of two episodes. Uh, we will be back uh, in the next episode to discuss a little bit more about spent hemp byproducts, uh, which is a completely different topic, but certainly extremely intriguing. Uh, but thanks again, Masmo. Thank you at home, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you.